Welcome to the Assembly of Silence Radio Hour. Okay. And here we are. So, first order of business is... This really has to be seen on the video. This episode is just not going to be so great if you're just listening to the audio. So I strongly encourage you uh, go to the YouTube channel. Link provided in show note description. And uh, and check it out there. Because it really will be a far richer experience. So I'm, uh, I'm really excited to... Welcome this next guest to the show. She is not only the first female guest on the show, but she is also one of the most interesting YouTubers out there. I'm talking about Lori Gardy, also known as Fractal Woman. Her channel on YouTube is called Fractal Woman. And for the last 10 years, she has been making an incredible range of videos on uh, a wide set of different topics. Her name, of course, gives you a pretty good clue as to what some of it is about, but it ain't just pretty pictures. There's a lot going on here, and much of it is really very deep and uh, rigorous. There are a lot of videos here about electromagnetic theory, revisiting some of the basic concepts. She does deep dives into some of the great minds of electromagnetic theory, including people like Charles Proteus Steinmetz and Maxwell, and there's a series on Ken Wheeler, and there's also a deep dive into some of the papers of Eric Dollard, and there's also an interview with Eric Dollard here, which is incredibly uh, rare and interesting, and there are a variety of experimental videos where she shows experiments that demonstrate some of the ideas that she's talking about. For instance, here is one which illustrates the idea that magnetic attraction and repulsion can be explained through the behavior of spinning objects in a medium, which is profoundly interesting. And then there is also, uh, of course, an awful lot that has to do with fractals. Much of this is really uh, a way of relating a variety of different ideas in the service of a generalized model of this universe, but a model that's really more like a metaphor, which I think is actually a pretty good way of thinking of any model because no model is complete and exact, and sometimes the more poetic the model, the more complete it is. So there's a lot to explore here. I really urge everyone to check out her channel. It is really incredible, and I'm really pleased to welcome her to the show. So without further ado, I give you my conversation with Lori Gardy, otherwise known as Fractal Woman. So let's see. Now, there's so many things that you're involved in your scope is very wide and (laughs) that's one of the things i really love because there's there's a through line through a lot of it as well so it's not as if it's just uh, here and there but it seems like it's not just random stuff yeah it's not just random stuff and so you know you're you're uh, a professional computer scientist if i understand correctly and in some respects i guess we might say that your main interest is theoretical physics and a uh, lot of yep, uh, uh, that yeah. is my actually. I, I'm going to clarify that with um, I consider myself more of a I call myself a closet cosmologist. <laughs> so I'm more of a cosmologist, right? So because I didn't, you know, study cosmology and get a PhD in psycho, in um, you know, so I I consider myself a closet cosmologist because I'm interested in uh, in everything at every scale. So cosmology isn't just about space. People think, oh, cosmology is about space. Well, I extend cosmology to how does the universe work? And that includes the quantum scale. That includes biology, right? So in order for me to be a proper cosmologist to understand how the universe works, we also have to understand how biology works, you know, sort of thing. So uh, that's why, you know, it does seem like I'm doing a lot of random things, but I'm trying to tie everything together through... Uh, using the fractal paradigm right Right. so using the fractal paradigm 
Yeah. What I'm trying to do is find similar laws at different scales. So instead of saying, oh, the cosmic scale is one thing and the quantum scale is another thing and they're not, they have nothing in common, try to find what is in common right. and then apply and then scale the laws of physics. That's what I'm trying to do with my research. Yeah. Which in some ways is like a recapitulation of the ancient uh, as above, so below law. You know, the idea that uh, it's one universe. and Exactly. It's exactly as above, so below. Yeah. Yep. Which is beautiful. That's one of the things I, I really love about your work and, and the general thrust of your thinking. Uh, just before we move on, I'm kind of curious about the word closet, if it's just a joke or if it's also... Like you're consigned to a closet because anyone who thinks differently than the mainstream is sort of automatically consigned to a closet or is it that you prefer to be yeah, in? You know actually, I mean? it's because most of my work is done in the closet, like in my <laughs> office here, but by myself, right? Because I don't have yeah. any colleagues doing this with me. So right. I feel like I'm doing it and in, in, I'm making you know, doing my research on my own, taking my own path. Um, you know, I'm discussing with people, but for years I didn't. For years I was literally in the closet. I was just doing it, trying to, ha you know, hack out how this could work uh, with no collaboration whatsoever. Well, that's very interesting. You know, I, I think that in some ways we're living in a golden age of closet researchers. Exactly. And, and one of the real challenges, you know, one of the real challenges is figuring out a way to bring some of this important work together. And uh, one of the things I really like about what you do is you're very concerned with terminology and you've even proposed uh, a modified unit analysis, a, a different way of expressing equations that is really, well, you know, to some extent outside my ballpark. So it's a little difficult for me to comprehend, but I do understand the basic idea. And it strikes me as being really important. The way that we choose to express things has an awful lot to do with what it actually ends up signifying. Yeah, or how people interpret things. It's more, yes. so the analysis is just a, me being super rigorous, right? I'm being super rigorous because rigor is really important in science. And so um, by me being super rigorous, I had to add something to the unit analysis and modify it. So it's not that different from the real. It's just a little bit more in my, you know, in my uh, humble opinion, it is more rigorous than the, what the standard unit analysis is. They missed something. They forgot to put something in the units or they just didn't bother writing it, um, thinking that everyone assumed that they were, there, but they weren't there. So, yeah. So uh, rigor, it's about rigor. It's about language. It's about you know, if you're going to use a word, you better define it for me so that I understand what you're talking about, because there are a lot of ambiguous terms in physics right and often i'm arguing with someone and we're arguing we think no i'm right no i'm right well we're not using the same language we're in babylon you know we're not using the same language exactly and we're but we are talking about the same thing yes and it happens to me all the time and i argue with these guys and it's usually guys so i'm you know we're talking about gender here and you know i'm dealing mostly with you know guys to be totally right. honest yep. and um I run into trouble. I get I get into trouble, and we can talk about that because that might I I feel like that's kind of what you wanted to talk about. You know the sort of gender uh, differences, you know, in the field and that sort of thing. But, I think that that's a, yeah. an interesting area to explore. I mean, obviously, gender is an incredibly hot topic right now, and it's basically a minefield, really. Yep. But. Uh, particularly yep, that's when it why comes I was a to... little hesitant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was a little hesitant at, when you asked me this and I'm like, okay, so am I getting myself into trouble here? <laughs> right. People are going to think I'm sexist because I think there's two genders. <laughs> like, <laughs> so yeah, uh, it's a well, risk. Well, you know, here we are. And, and one of the strange things about it, of course, yeah. is what, what you're describing initially here is a, uh, a, a real desire on your part to be careful about the words you're using and to really try as much as possible to pin the definitions down so that we really know what we're talking about. Yeah. And it strikes me as being 
quite odd that that's not something that the mainstream scientific community seems to be particularly interested in, which I think is exactly, mm -hmm. you know, the sign of Babylon. That's that's where we are, you know, so it's that's it. You know, the, there's nothing yeah. more dangerous mm -hmm. uh, in the time of Babylon than the truth. And so, you know, it's it's a it's a tricky situation. But the question of what a female perspective on physics is, is something that I've been wondering about because a lot of people would think, well, you know, men are more sort of analytically based. And so they would be the ones who would be more predisposed to be uh, insisting on defining things rigorously. So I'm curious to know what your what your whole sense of it is. OK, so um, in terms of OK, I can only tell you really how what I do, my my approach is um, to my study of physics is that I kind of spiral around the problem. And maybe just the way I'm wired, I don't know. Like, I don't know if it's male or female, but it feels more like a female thing to me that and I notice, I pay attention. I'm very observant. That's one thing about me is I'm very observant, even with myself. I'm very proud of the fact that I'm on that video camera there and I hate myself on video. But anyways, um, so <laughs> women, sp <laughs> women spiral around the problem, I think, at least I huh. do. Uh, and men want to get there as fast as they can. That's that's interesting. I want to really, truly understand. I don't want to sort of get there and go, oh, I'm here now. Right. I want to, like, really understand every little detail because every little detail is important, I think. And so, you know, I spiral around. Like, I'll come back to a problem over and over and over again. Every time I see it a little differently. Right? Yeah. Just how I do it. And I feel like men... They just want to get there tomorrow. <laughs> so when I interact with yeah. men, okay, they get really frustrated with me because I didn't get there tomorrow. I'm taking my time. They don't have, they lose their patience with me. I think, I don't know. It sounds like you're describing a, a nonlinear equation versus, you know, basically as the crow flies, you know, the sort of direct path yeah. idea, <laughs> which cuts through everything. I mean, you could say like the direct path has a fundamentally disrespectful way of going about doing things. You know, uh, I remember, I mean, at, at a point in the past where I was a much angrier young man, where I was just intent on making the mm -hmm. most direct path from point A to point B uh, when I was living in a city, you know, so there was something about, you know, time and just feeling like that. And I realized eventually, like, that was a really stupid approach. <laughs> So it may be that there's a biological kind of predisposition, but that the gender side of it really may be more of the story that it's really kind of a frame of mind. Yeah. And so as the, the as you use the word anger, so you, you know, for, like you said, you maybe would get angry when you couldn't get somewhere very quickly. And so that, I find that interesting because I do see that a lot with the, the men that I'm, you know, interacting with on these subjects and they seem to very quickly want to get angry very quickly. If I don't, um, sort of support their narrative if hmm. i don't if i don't support their if i don't like stroke their ego maybe but if i don't like support their narrative or even if they're wrong if i don't support their narrative <laughs> right. they get really frustrated <laughs> with me they get really mad and then they, they, they it happened to me like twice this week where people shut me down because i wasn't um either i wasn't quick to respond as they wanted me to be or i uh didn't um support their narrative Hmm. So that's something interesting. I know it's just it with my interaction with men and women. And so when I am in conversation with like, I've been experimenting with people my entire adult life. I'm a very observant person. And when I get bored, I, I kind of do the look at how people interact with each other. So I'm just curious about it. And I see how people interact. And so when, um, so when women talk to each other, they're very supportive of each other's narratives. They're very supportive mm. and they will not change the subject until you, they're sure you're done talking about what you want to talk about. So when mm. women, you see women, blah, 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 they, uh, they're like, you know, doing something different. Now, when I talk to a guy, what I find is um, he continuously wants to change the narrative. But then that frustrates women because they're like, I wasn't done talking about what I want. They were just waiting for their turn to talk. 
people like that's <laughs> right. how I see it. Like men are just sort of okay. I'm pretending to listen to you, and I'm going to change the subject as soon as you stop talking, or they'll interrupt you and then change the subject right away, and that pisses off women. So that's <laughs> most of the fights that men and women have are because of that. Huh? And women shouldn't yeah. talk to each other that, unless that they realize that's what's going on, right? Like you, just, like me think, yeah. If you just think about it. And then when guys talk to each other, they they one up each other, but they like that. It's fun for them. Oh, uh, they, you know, no, I'm gonna, no, I'm gonna do this, right? And so <laughs> that's I'm not saying in I'm not saying one way is right or wrong, or we're talking about differences here. And there are distinct differences with how men communicate to each other, how women communicate to each other, and how men communicate with women. So, right. so, so would you say that on some level, uh, the, the male and female um, mindset are uh, incommensurate conjugates? Uh, exactly. Yep. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Uh, and it, it's not a it's not a bad thing, though. Like if we if, if we would realize it, we would realize that, um, you know, when you could recognize when it happens and stop the fight before it's, you know, it ruins your relationship. You know what I mean? Like, right. That sort of thing. So right. we need to like stop pretending that, you know, a woman should stop pretending that her man should act like a woman and a woman should stop pretending that, the, you know, her man, you know, the other way around. So um, I think it would save a lot of fights. I think we could help, help a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You so know, I've I seen think it that... happen. I've seen relate. I've seen, People talk themselves out of a relationship. I've seen them do it. Right. I've watched it. Yeah, it's incredibly consequential. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think it's unfortunately incredibly common too that uh, people yep. get into these mm -hmm. ir ir irreconcilable, unresolvable uh, conflicts yeah. just because they don't realize that you're talking to someone who sees things in a very different way. And if we can characterize yep. it, I mean, you, you've characterized it in, in uh, you could say, well, we have a linear male and we have a nonlinear female, I guess, would that be yeah. fair? Fair way That's of putting what it? I, I think I even said that in one of my videos and I got into a lot of trouble. Like one person said, oh, you're sexist. I'm going to unsubscribe to you. There's always going to be one, you know? I, I know. It's. I just went, okay, I don't need you. <laughs> but yeah, there, it's... Um, that's how I see it. When I, you know, I remember when I was in high school and, you know, I, people, you know, we did painting and I, so I noticed that the men, they wanted to draw lines and like, they wanted to draw like a building with straight lines. And, and I noticed that the women were, they wanted to paint spirals. They wanted to make, you know, flowery things, not flowers even, but just even the painting I did, it was all spirals. And I just felt compelled to do to do that and mm. then you know the guys were always doing more anyway so little things like that they're little clues to you know that men are more linear thinker and we need to have both and that's where the principle of incommensurability comes in because men and women aren't the same and we should remove the word equal from the language <laughs> that is an ambiguous term and we should not be saying men and women are equal okay it is an ambiguous term and I want to get rid of all the ambiguous terms. And that is an ambiguous term because we are not even close to being the same. It's like saying A is equal to B, you know, that can only be true if A is equal to B, if A is one and B is one, and that's not male and female. So right. we are not equal. And it's, it's a terrible term. We should, you know, use, you know, like when they say equal pay for equal job, we should say similar pay for similar job. Right. And that would remove this people thinking that we are equal as in the equal sign in a, in a, in a mathematical equation. It's a bad, bad, bad term, in my opinion. Absolutely. And, th and that is a huge hot button issue right now. It is. Um, I'm going to get hate mail. For <laughs> it's, it's so tricky. And, and, you know, we're reasonable people in, in the sense that we like to reason our way through things. But uh, of course, that's not everybody. You know, some people would say mm -hmm. that that reasoning is uh, more of a traditional male characteristic, and I, I don't think that's really mm -hmm. the case. I just think that you know, nonlinear thinking doesn't look reasonable to a linear thinker. Exactly, and that's that's where a lot of the arguments come from because <laughs> it seems irrational to the guy to hear. You know, 
Yeah. But yeah, if, it's like if you have data points that are all over the spectrum and, and the person you're speaking to only has data points that are all lined up in a row, it's very difficult, <laughs> difficult for them to yeah. go, well, what's the validity of that data point? Yeah. Equal, mm -hmm. I think originally the idea was like equal protection under the law, which makes a certain mm -hmm. amount of sense, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's what we would hope for. But the irony, of course, now is that we're being told that everybody's equal or that we should be. And yet it's so obvious that everyone is being treated mm -hmm. so unequally and that there isn't yep. equal protection under the law anymore. Yep. You know, which is, I mean, nope. the inversion well, of Babylon is really complete and it's it's frightening. Mm -hmm. um, it is terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. I'm grateful that other that other people like yourself are seeing this, right? Because not everyone is seeing this and it's really frustrating because I feel like I can see things that other people aren't seeing. And so when yeah. I start to bring it up in conversation, it's, you know, I get into a lot of trouble. So well, I wonder people sometimes, aren't seeing it or not wanting. Go, yeah, yeah go I think quite often there are people, there are many people who do see it, but are just too scared to say anything about it. And you know, that gets down to the question of, well, uh, what is accomplished by talking about it other than to uh, kind of go through the catharsis? Or, I mean, it seems like there yeah. is yeah, something, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you, you know, I don't enough. really know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't really know. Talk, you know, talk is cheap. Talk, talk, is, talk cheap. is cheap. Right. right. But on the other hand, you know, if, if the pen is mightier than the sword, then, you know, the word is the thing that that starts that pen writing. So. Yeah, we have to, we have, I guess, a responsibility to to call things as we see them. Uh, what else can we do? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to pick up a sword. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, one question that that uh, comes up is, well, do you have women who are in the field that you speak with and how different is that experience? Like in, on the various topics that you're exploring and working on. Do you have some women that you can speak with and and can you describe how that goes? I'm going to say no, not on a regular basis, um, because most of my girlfriends, female friends aren't really interested in this stuff. So I can kind of bring it up in. Um, I have a few friends that are really um, they just love hearing me talk about this stuff, even though they can't contribute anything. Right. So um, they think I'm smart, but I'm, you know, I just, I like to say I'm not smart. I just work really hard. I do work really hard. I study a lot. I work really hard. You know, I might look like a genius to someone and, you know, an idiot to someone else. So, anyways, that's, I just work hard and I study hard. And, you know, so my friends aren't into this stuff. They, um, they're always amazed at some of the things that I'm doing, but I don't really have any female friends. Mm collaborators that I could have this kind of conversation with. It's always a, a male. Interesting. So <laughs> it's a little disappointing if there's any girls out there, you know, that want to talk to me that are into physics and cosmology, let me know. <laughs> so so we could say fair. that really there's, there, you know, one way that we might go about criticizing uh, the field of science, let's just say as a kind of general umbrella term is that, uh, well, particularly, I guess, in theoretical physics is that we're not hearing uh, that female perspective in that realm. Now, you know, exactly. there are some people. It's very rare. Yeah, there's some people who I mean, there are a, a number who are kind of entering it. But most of the ones that I'm aware of are basically mouthpieces for the establishment for what's already come before. Yeah. Um, which yeah. I think is a kind of a tragedy. But they kind of have to play the game. Mm hmm. Yeah, well, that's you the other thing, too, a, is, yeah, it seems like there's so... If you look uh, at my demographic, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about the delay. I have terrible internet, which is really not a great thing no, for a podcaster to have, so... <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's okay. I already forgot what I was about uh, to say, so why don't you say what you were going to say? Oh, I was going to say, if you look at my demographic on my YouTube channel, um, that it will 100% male. Hmm. It says 100% male. Okay, so yeah. that doesn't mean every everyone is, you know, so I have, let's say I have now almost 6,000 um, subscribers. So even if, let me see, how many would that be? You know, if I had a couple dozen 
uh, women on, you know, following me, um, that would still be a hundred percent. It'd be 96 point or 99.6 percent or something, which they would say hundred percent anyway. So there are some women that do, uh, contact me and, you know, so I know they're there, but, um, it's not, you know, almost hundred percent male. So, you know, that's, I don't know, really, I don't know if I'm just, uh, wired differently. Okay. I am wired differently. hundred percent. No. I know I'm wired differently and I don't know if that's why I am different than most women that uh, don't tend to, you know, go down this path. So I don't know. I think I'm sort of maybe a little bit. There's it probably percentage wise in the male population, there is not that many people who are interested in it either, you know? So it seems that when it comes to theoretical physics, most people would rather talk about something else. Um, exactly. So, you know, maybe it shouldn't come as such a great surprise. And, you know, but on the other hand, I don't have a large audience, but my demographic is also, I think, uh, registering around 100 percent male. And um, mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken, I think YouTube is is largely male. I don't remember what the percentage is, but I think it's oh, mostly yeah. males <laughs> who watch YouTube. I'm sure there's plenty of right. females, but it's still the, the vast majority, I think, is male. Okay. Yeah, I never really thought about that. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to speculate on why that might be. Well, let's <laughs> let's talk a bit about fractals are- because you know <laughs> okay. you are you are uh you've given yourself the name fractal woman, and much yep. of your work is uh not only describing the the interesting features of fractal geometry, but also relating that to some of the features of uh, our universe and our reality. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the thing that strikes me as being maybe the, the, the kind of core question is the extent to which the metaphor really works. Like, there are obviously some incredibly enticing um, parallels, but of course the fractal geometry is basically a two dimensional projection and we're living in a nominally three dimensional world. So yep. it's obviously like not the, it's not the equation that's that's defining this universe that we're living in. So I'm just kind of curious to hear you talk about that interface. Okay. Thanks. That's a great question. Um, so the Mendelbrot set, which is like the most famous fractal, it is a good starting point because it is freakishly simple. The equation Z equals Z squared plus C is a very simple equation, and yet it can create infinite complexity. Okay, infinite complexity. So that is my first order. Like, how can the universe be so complex and yet be simple? Well, that is one way that, you know, the Mendelbrot set the metal brought fractal shows that a very simple equation can create um, complexity, right? So can you see my mouse moving around? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. So this is the, you know, standard metal brought set fractal Z equals Z squared, you know, Z equals Z squared plus C. Okay. So this is sort of just a simple, I like to use this uh, figure because it's very uh, descriptive. And so, and this is where, you know, I can start talking about the principle of incommensurability because I see, you know, like this black region out here and this sort of gradient region out here um, are incommensurate principles. Okay. They're, they are nothing like each other. And so the points from, um, from this black region, they kind of spiral into singularity and the points on the outside, they kind of, expand out to infinity right and so what you find is so at the interface between two incommensurate principles at least in this Mendelbrot fractal you find this you know crazy very complicated one dimension okay so the Mendel and so we're talking about dimensionality the Mendelbrot set is two-dimensional right? Because it's, it's uh, based on complex numbers and complex numbers are two dimensional numbers. And so, but this interface, so interfaces are always one dimensional, right? Hmm. So even though, you know, the way I paint 
this uh, this boundary here, it looks two dimensional. It looks like it has thickness. And that's just so you can see the boundary. But in reality, there is an inside and there's an outside. I call it inner world and outer world. Okay, so between inner world and outer world is fractal, right? In at least in this um, in this uh, situation here, right? Or complexity. So you can generalize that to complexity. Well, where is complexity in our universe? Well, I can tell you from the principle of incommensurability that the where you know where you see complexity, you are going to find uh, incommensurate principles, you know, regardless of the, it's not going to look like the Mendelbrot set, but it might actually look like the Mendelbrot set. Right. So, well, it's the boundary, it's the boundary condition between incommensurate principles, right? Exactly. The boundary yeah. condition between, um, incommensurate principles, that's where information lives. Right. So and we can see that forget about geometry. We can see that uh, yeah. because basically life is a thin uh, s surface yeah. phenomena on our planet. The yeah. interface between what should we call it? Heaven and earth, I think, is the nicest way uh, of putting I'm it. I'm going to just call them, you know what? I'm just going to call them inner world and outer world. I think because that, mm. you know, people, some people use space and counter space, right? Yeah. Space and counter space. But I don't like that because that, that's an ambiguous term. Counter space is ambiguous. So I decided I'm going to start using inner world and outer world because there's always an inner world mm. that has a boundary condition and an outer world that doesn't have a boundary condition. Great. So like a cell cell membrane would be a, an example of that, that sort of thing. Yeah. Perfect. I like that. I've I've been troubled by the term counter space for a long time. It's it's yeah, I know it caused a lot. Then this is where you know the language. It's all about the language. As soon as I started using inner world and outer world, hmm. in my mind, it it clicked. I went, oh yeah, counter space is an ambiguous term, so I shouldn't be using it. So uh, inner world and outer the between inner world and outer world. That's where you're going to find um, phenomenon. Right. There's one thing, however, uh, if if you don't mind me just kind of uh, poking at this a little bit, the, the question of whether or not there is something that is counter to space, let's say. So inner world, outer world, we're talking about something that exists within space. But then there is this question whether or not there is a, uh, let's say, a non-dimensional domain, something along those lines. And if that's you know, maybe perhaps what we would call counter space, you know, uh, what, what, what do you think about that, that question? Um, now that that's definitely possible. That's definitely possible. Um, so there's a couple other terms in physics that, uh, confound people and that is dark matter and dark energy. Mm. Okay. So I can say that, uh, on the universal scale, um, dark matter and dark energy are incommensurate principles. Okay. We don't know what dark matter is. They haven't detected it. We don't know what dark energy is, even though you guys got a Nobel prize on, <laughs> you know, measuring the expansion right. of the universe, they still don't know what dark energy is. And so in, in my uh, principle, in the principle, dark matter would correspond to the black region of the mental broad set and dark energy would correspond to um, this outer region. Now, this is, you know, then we're getting away from the idea of, of a spatial because spatial is phenomenon that we can observe. And that is at this event horizon here, right? So dark matter is in a direction we can't see. And dark energy is in a direction we can't see, which I think is kind of what you were just talking about. Well, my understanding of dark matter is that it's a way of trying to account for observations of galactic rotations using gravity as yep. the primary model without having any um, other evidence yep. for the actual presence of that of that material. So it's kind of a hack, really. It's just and I'm I know. So I'm using I'm changing the meaning of the terms dark matter and dark energy to mean that which causes the flat rotation curves of galaxies and that which causes us to think that the universe is expanding. Mm. So the observations are correct. The observations are correct. It's our explanations are wrong. 
Okay, right. because we're, you know, we're living in this three dimensional, we think that dark matter should be a particle that we can ponder, and dark energy is some energy source that we, you know, can, that we can ponder. So the only thing we can ponder is what's at this event horizon between two and commensurate principles. Because in a way, that's where we are. That's where we are. Yeah, we're embedded in some little area. Yeah. An infinitesimally small area of that of that yep. uh, membrane, let's say. Exactly. Of the membrane. And that's, a you know, of the boundary of the membrane. Membrane is a really good term. I like that term. So, yeah. So, dark matter is on this side of the membrane and dark energy is on this side of the membrane. We are never going to be able to see that. We're not going right. to be able to detect it. And this is my, this is my um, prediction. Hmm. Based on my Mandelbrot model, which isn't physical reality. This is just a, allows me to understand the concept, right, of incommensurability and the boundary condition being information, being mm. complexity, being phenomenon, that which you can observe. Okay, you we cannot just observe dark matter, and we cannot observe dark energy. We can only observe, you know, the outcome, the emergent properties of dark matter and dark energy. Mm. So, you know, my, I only use the term dark matter and dark energy because people find they're familiar. Right. I can start the conversation and say, and then say, no, I'm changing the definition of dark matter. Yeah. It may be the kind of thing that eventually would, would benefit from a different term because there's so much uh, uh, weight behind those terms already. And I think also there's a fair amount of skepticism. Yeah. I would just call it inner world and outer world, but this is, an explanation for dark, what they perceive as dark matter. And this is an explanation for what they perceive as dark energy. And so I do still have to use those terms because if I'm ever going to have a conversation with a, you know, a real cosmologist about this subject, I, I need to at least start with the terms they know. And they say, Hey, but I am just changing it a little bit here, you know, to fit with the, with the print, this principle that I'm trying to, you know, um, you know, bring into, you know, to help people understand what's going on. Right. If I can't help people understand what's going on. then there's not Yeah. Most cosmologists, I mean, I've attempted to speak with some, some people in the mainstream uh, and it's, it's almost impossible. And I think most cosmologists wouldn't be satisfied with, uh, with something which is fundamentally, I mean, I'm trying to think of what the right word is, but it's basically a metaphor. It's basically a mathematical metaphor that has striking parallels to the observable universe. And one of the things I've wondered is, mm -hmm. you know, I understand that part of the reason why it has these properties is because you're using complex numbers and that the real and imaginary axes are how this whole thing is plotted out. But is there a three-dimensional projection of, the, of, of a fractal geometry that might have these properties and and sort of function within space as we experience it. One of the other things that's occurred to me is that quite often within the mainstream cosmology, they'll talk about space as if it were flat, which is something that I've never been able to really get my head around, but I know that that's what they do. So, you know, maybe it is the case that, uh, you know, when you take the universe, which is a rather large object into consideration, we are kind of talking about a comparatively flat um, uh, object, you know, so, so, so it may yeah. be that this two dimensional yeah, I, projection is, is more accurate than one might think, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not really sure when they talk about flat, they just mean it's not curved, right? They just mean it's not curved. So I don't, when they say flat, you have to be careful what they're talking about. It doesn't mean two dimensional. Flat does not necessarily have to mean two-dimensional, right? So, you know... So, yeah. not curved means that it, it ha it's basically uniform? Yeah, and so uh, here's the other thing that... Um, there's, there's this thing called the fractal debate in cosmology, okay? And there are a lot of researchers that, you know, they're, they're looking at the, um, the uh, statistical... They're looking at it statistically, okay? And they're looking at the galaxies, and they notice that the galaxies clump together... Right. And so what they do is they um, what they're trying to do is they're trying to see if, if the universe is, you know, if it's fractal, then it would, you know, clump together. You know, if you 
you know, at larger and larger scales kind of thing. And what they're finding is that, you know, when they when they go bigger and bigger scale, that the universe seems to be, um, you know, more uniform. But here's the thing. And they're saying, oh, so the universe isn't fractal. OK, so because it's uniform at one scale, oh, that the universe that the universe isn't fractal. Well, number one, I found a flaw in their um, methods that they're using to do this calculation because I did the same experiment they did on an actual fractal and I got the same results. So mm. it's just like saying, and so uh, the other thing is you can see in this fractal here that there's regions of complexity, but when you go way outside over here, you've got a region of that's homogeneous. Mm. So homogene homogeneity, homogeneity and fractality can coexist. They can coexist and they do co coexist. You've got homogeneity out here at the large scale. Here, and you've got homogeneity in here as well, right? So there's a whole, the universe is almost whole, all, the whole thing is almost homogeneous, except for this boundary here that's not homogeneous, right? right. Fractal makes up a very small... Oh small part and here's where like dark energy and dark matter and dark energy and visible matter almost work out with when you look at this so if this is dark energy sorry if this is dark matter this makes up about say 25 percent of the this universe hmm. so if this is dark matter this is about 25 percent of the pixels this is about 70 with you know between 60 and 70 percent of the pixels and and visible matter, this boundary here looks like it only takes up about five percent of this picture, and that's exactly the numbers that they give us for dark matter, dark energy, and visible matter. Visible matter makes up a very small percentage of our universe, like what they say, like five percent. Hmm. And visible matter, like this fractal boundary, really only occupies a tiny uh, fraction of the pixels in this universe, right? Um, and so this, again, as a metaphor, the Mendelbrot set kind of shows that, you know, dark matter and dark matter energy are, if this could be dark matter and this could be dark energy, that it matches what we observe in the actual universe. Right. Did that make sense? Very interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting. Could you say one more time, because the internet broke up and I think it's a really important point. So I'd like you to, if you don't okay. mind, just talk again about uh, the observations that the mainstream cosmologists have made about the clumping together of galaxies and how when you go to a larger scale, it becomes uh, homogeneous and how you did the same experiment yeah. with a fractal, because I'm afraid it kind of broke up there. Oh, yeah. OK, so um, in mainstream, in mainstream, they um, uh, they tell us that 25 um, percent of the universe is dark matter. You know, 70 percent of the universe is dark energy and for the visible universe is only about 5 percent, makes up only 5 percent of what we observe. OK, so, and, and by observe, it means through the flat rotations of galaxies, through the clumping of galaxies, they assume there's a certain amount of dark matter. And because the universe is ex, you know, expanding, what well, looks like it's expanding and, and it looks like it's accelerating, they call that dark energy. And it looks like dark energy makes up about 70% of the universe. And, and the same thing happens, the same thing happens uh, here in the metal bras. This is about you know, maybe 20, 25% of this, of this universe. This is about 70% and the boundary only takes up about, um, you know, 5% of this image. Okay. And so mm -hmm. the other thing you asked me to um, talk about was the, how, um, you know, the cosmologists in order to determine whether the universe is fractal or not, what they do is they look at the clumping of galaxies at different scales. And what they found was that the, um, you know, when they choose, when they, they do this algorithm, it's called um, points in spheres. So they basically count the number of galaxies in a sphere, and then they make the spheres bigger and bigger and bigger. And as they go bigger and bigger and bigger, they find that the, um, the universe seems more homogeneous. Hmm. Okay. And so the important point I wanted to make there is that, um, first of all, I found a flaw in using this counts in spheres. Um, 
And I actually used calcium spheres on a known fractal, a fractal that I know is a fractal, and got the same results they got. And so there's a flaw in their experiment, in their thinking. But also you can see that a large part of the Mendelbrot universe is homogeneous. It's homogeneous here. It's homogeneous in here. And but it is not homogeneous in a very small region, about 5%, let's say, of this image here is complexity, is mm -hmm. observable, is, you know, something that looks like that. <laughs> very, you know, right. very pretty. You could say that that's where that's where all the action is. That's existence, if you like. That's that's where all of these things that you see are on this edge here. Yeah. All of these beautiful images, you know, all these wonderful fractals are on that edge. So that, that's one of my favorites. And if I understand correctly, uh, that is an incredible image. Yeah. If I understand correctly, the, the fractals on the inside of the boundary coalesce towards one point. In essence, they kind of collapse into a, a center and the fractals on the outside of the boundary sort of dissipate and and uh, disperse off into infinity, perhaps. Is that one way of thinking of it? Yeah. So I'd like to uh, call them trajectories. They're not really fractals. They're, it's all like the fractals are patterns. But what happens when you iterate this function, when you mm. pick a point on the complex plane, now I kind of wished I'd set up a, let's see if I have that in here somewhere. And that would be basically when you're, when you're, it's for every value of C that there's a a, yeah. a kind of subset. It's a Julia set, I think, is what it's called, right? Yeah, e yeah. Each point, yeah. So each C, each each value of C on on the complex plane generates a unique Julia set. But when you iterate them, what happens is so every time you iterate once, you get a new number. And so if right. I iterate and get a new number and plot it, I'm going to get a trajectory. So it's going to spiral around and the ones on on the black in the black region they kind of spiral down towards a single like point in the complex plane. Mm. So they start here but then they spiral in, they never go out here. Right? They always stay just like a black hole. And that's why I have my black hole analogy. This is a black hole. It's, this is a photon sphere and this is the event horizon. So I actually mm. literally refer to this as an event horizon mm -hmm. in my black hole. It makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, my Mandelbrot set as a quasi black hole, which I don't think I have here, but yeah. So this is a recursive equation. Yes, it's the recursive equation. And and you use you, and, you do a wonderful bit of wordplay where you talk about how C is a seed, and you also refer to it as yeah. karma because in essence it's sort of like what <laughs> yes. you know what you what you put into it is what comes out yep. right. Exactly. And it is literally karma. So I did what Zen equals Zen squared plus karma mm -hmm. was an art show I did many, many years ago. That's great. So I love that. I think I put that in my, I think I put that in one of my videos too. But so it is a nice kind of uh, poetic way of thinking about it. Um, so C is the seed. It is right. the seed point with which you start this iteration process. And then, so the points in here collapse towards singularity and the points out here kind of diverge out to, you know, infinity. And they make really cool images themselves. And again, I don't think I have that here. Let's see. Oh, here we go. So um, these are the kinds of images. Let me just do this. Let me see if you can see this. You see that zooming in? Yes. Okay. So that is what happens. That is what happens to the points in the black region of the Mendelbrot set. They literally kind of spiral in, in towards a single so point. So this is the inner world dynamics. It's a dynamical system. Yeah, it's di there's dynamics going on here, right? It's a yeah. dynamical thing. So I can like follow the point in. So it's like now I'm, I'm following the iteration in. Uh, and it keeps going and going and going and going and going, right? Until I run out of digits of precision. Okay, right. So in a second, it's going to run out. Of, when the computer runs out of digits of precision, it breaks down. But that doesn't mean, it, you know, it can keep going forever and ever, theoretically, mathematically, 
if I had more, you know, if I could double my digits of precision, I could zoom in twice as far. Right. Right. So, you know, for twice as long a time. So, um, so that's kind of cool, but so that's uh, the points on the inside create kind of trajectories like this. And in this one, I've joined the lines. Mm. So the lines are being joined. So you can kind of see, you know, um, what it looks like there, but, um, the points on the outside. So the points on the, the, from here, they expand towards, um, you know, infinity. And so, but what I did was I went searching for some really complicated ones and um, this is what I found. Okay. Mm. So when I put this in my paper, the Mendel brought set as quasi quasi black hole, but so these are cosmological objects, right? Each of these, this is the cartwheel nebula. This is the or cartwheel galaxy, the stingray nebula. I think that's the cat's eye nebula. Mm. And this is Einstein's cross. Mm. So I was able to find uh, trajectories so, you know, this is what they look like when, when you get really, really, really close to that boundary. So mm. there is a very, that, that, um, you know, boundary between these two, when you get really, 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 really close, then you end up with um, very complex looking structures that look exactly like things, you know, uh, that nature makes. That's fascinating. Why is there a colon after Z in the Z equals Z squared plus C? Uh that okay so some mathematicians are really picky about you know i should put z with a subscript n and you know blah 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 like so it's a notation thing and this is from a note from a computer language called pascal mm. and when you it's an assignment so it you know basically this means you know the same as if i did the mathematical notation you know n z uh, subscript n equals z you know n minus one squared plus c so this is, I just do that because, um, you know, people complain to me about my notation. So this is a computer science notation that means, you know, this becomes a new Z, you know, because Z is on both sides of the equation, right? Gotcha. It means that there's a feedback loop. Right. And so this is just, it's just a computer science notation, you know, from the Pascal days. So I don't know if you know about Pascal, but it was one of the computer languages that I spent a lot of time with. I remember Pascal, yeah. It was kind of before C, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's just, yeah, that's kind of a good question. I, I don't, yeah, I didn't really, you know, ex expect uh, that question. But that's kind of, I do everything for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I figure, yeah. But anyway, so this is, this is really interesting, though. I feel like this is what clinched it for me that I'm on the right path, mm. regardless of whether I can explain it or not. Yeah, no, you can't. You can't deny it. There's something very interesting. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the work of Anthony Peratt and the whole electric universe world. Uh, yeah, yeah. I follow them. Uh-huh. So he's he's produced yeah. uh, similar morphologies in a laboratory setting with um, with plasma discharge, which is kind of interesting. And and of course, plasma has a filamentary structure to it, which I think one could mm -hmm. uh could correlate to fractal geometry. And it mm -hmm. also, if I'm not mistaken, when it comes to that issue we were discussing earlier about the, the, uh, the so-called homogeneous universe, uh, it's become, mm -hmm. I think, pretty well recognized that galaxies and stars both exist on these kind of filamentary structures, uh, which yep. would suggest, you know, uh, a fractal design and also suggest uh, Birkeland currents, which is what uh, the electric universe yep. people call it. So it seems like there's a wonderful yep. opportunity for integration. Uh, you know, I'm interested in a lot of different ideas and I, and I feel like bringing them together in some way or another would be just wonderful. Yep. And so uh, yep. there seems the to be a lot The thing that I like about the Birkeland currents, the Birkeland mm. currents are have a property of self-similarity. Mm. Right, they can occur at any scale, and same with these plasma discharges. They right. they can occur at any scale. They have anything that has a property of self similarity is likely how our universe works. Right? right, if you can find the property of self similarity, so that's why I like the plasma universe because it plasma has a property of self similarity. They can recreate galaxies that in a jar, like mm -hmm. Eric Dollar does. You right. know, they can they you know so those those shapes are. are um, are you know scalable and so it makes more sense to look at if you can produce it on the desktop 
why not apply that same law, uh, you know, to the rest of the galaxy? It's so much more elegant. I mean, it's 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 Occam's razor. And the interesting thing is um, these pictures that I generated, these trajectories could be um, thought of as a discharge. OK, mm. they're, they're analogous to discharge, because when you take a point from the, the outside of the, you know, of this fractal and you iterate it, it expands and it, it's very much like a discharge. It's mm. very much like a discharge. So, you know, and you could think there's a nebula. Well, how was a nebula formed? A nebula was formed when a star exploded. A star explosion is a discharge. Right. So this is creating the patterns that you see when you have discharges interesting right you know so that's one maybe we could use yeah so that brings up yeah. an interesting question about time because you could say that on uh that, that the Mandelbrot set is as if you had all events frozen in time that's kind of what you're getting but uh but of course well, not really be because it it takes time to iterate these functions they don't they're not just static it takes time so I equate time, it, you know, time with iteration when it comes to the Mendelbrot set. Mm. Okay, it, time is iteration, and and I have my own definition of time. My only, my very specific definition of time is that time is an emergent property of change. Mm. So time yeah. could not exist if, if change doesn't exist. I'm very specific on that. Okay, so time is an emergent property of change. We would not be able to perceive time if things didn't change. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. And so iteration is the agent of, of uh, change. So iteration is that which changes. So uh, w within this particular equation. With, well, just as, again, it's more as a concept, as an analogy. So this is the analogy of change, the cha kind of change that the universe does. Permanent change. So are you saying that all change, that we could think of all change in all phenomena as having an iterative uh, etiology? Uh, etiology is yeah. not the right word, but <laughs> well, <laughs> cause. I'm going I'm to tw twist that backwards and say iteration is an example of change that we would perceive as time. Okay, it's an example okay, yeah. of. So if because, I, I can't say that, right? Yeah. It is a it, way it, of perceiving time. The things right. that change. It's basically a clock. Yeah, but no, see, clocks are repetitive. I'm talking about permanent change. I'm talking about evolution and the aging process and like things that give us the perception of time. If we didn't age, we wouldn't have the mm. same perception of time that we do. If we didn't, you know, if things did, if, if the weather didn't change, if the universe wasn't expanding, if, you know, like if, stuff wasn't happening if change wasn't <laughs> happening like people freak out you know about you know climate change but you know what change is built into the equation so that's you know i, I say time is an emergent property of change and change is built into the equation that's an important part so and i got that from the mendelbrot set here change is built into the equation every time it's a transformation every time i do an iteration it is a transformation right it's a transformation. So it's transform, 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 transform. And that's what the universe is doing. The universe is continuously transforming. So would it be accurate to say that when we look at the Mandelbrot set, we really should think of it, should not think of it as a static image. We shouldn't think of it as- Exactly. Uh, yeah, because basically you're only getting a certain amount of resolution anyway, but fundamentally yeah, yeah. The, there's an element of choice when it comes to what's being, uh, what's being projected, what's being uh, resolved, if you like. Yeah, exactly. And it, takes, and it takes time for those things to come into being. They don't just instantaneously appear. And that's the important thing. It takes time for the universe to evolve. It takes time for evolution to happen. And so, again, it's just, you know, again, it's a metaphor. It's just a way of trying to perceive how the universe kind of comes into being, right? So would you say that, uh, you know, just to just to be really picky about terminology, I'm, I'm curious to know what you think about this. Would you yep. say that there is no real ontological basis for time? It's merely a descriptor of change. So it's fundamentally a feature yeah. of a conscious, a consciousness. It's a conscious uh, observation yeah. of, of change within phenomena, yeah. but has yeah. no actuality mm -hmm. to itself. Yeah. And 
Exactly. And that's a great way of looking at it. And bringing consciousness into it is really good because consciousness is the perception of change, mm. right? It's the perception of, you know, if, again, if things didn't change, there, there couldn't be consciousness. Right. And consciousness plays an interesting role in the, uh, the initiation of change. Every conscious being is making some kind of a choice, takes action. There's your karma, right? That's the seed. And that gets fed back in every time. That's the seed. Yep. Yeah, yep. Ab absolutely. I mean, it's such a beautiful, elegant uh, metaphor for what's going on, whether it whether it specifically describes the actual universe we're in. I mean, it just it, it describes it so beautifully, poetically. It, it, it seems yep. Uh, yep. that it would be ridiculous to try to refute it. There's another aspect of it, too, that I'd like you to discuss briefly, which is the chirality. Uh, we live in a universe where molecules and uh, are arranged uh, in a particular uh, direction. The natural form, I think they're all right-handed. Is that correct? If I remember. I think we live in a right-handed universe. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have also yeah. the uh, the rotation of uh, of the magnetic field around a uh, electrical impulse is also according to the right handed rule. It spins in a particular direction, and you have um, you know the poles of mm -hmm. magnets, which also have this kind of spin. And uh, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, around the the uh, real axis you have, which is the vertical axis in the image you're showing right now, you have uh, objects which spin in opposite directions, depending upon which side you go to. Yep. Is that correct? On either side, yeah. So yeah. it spins uh, yeah, counterclockwise here and clockwise here, or depending on where you are. So whatever it does here, it does the opposite on the other side. Now, That's regarding just... the chiral symmetry, of course, you see that with the Julia sets. Okay, so every point on the complex plane, every point in the Mendelbrot set, you know, generates a unique Julia set. And you see the Julia set has this chiral symmetry, mm. right? It's exactly the chiral symmetry where you have, you know, sort of, you know, it's not mirror image. You know, you have to flip it twice to get it back to where it was before. And so uh, chiral symmetry is built into the Mendelbrot set as well. You have, a, you have kind of a meta uh, chirality. On on both sides of the imaginary, uh, on both sides of the real axis, and then within each object, within each value of C, each Julia set also has a chirality, a chiral flip. Yeah, every single one. That's just fascinating. Isn't that cool? That's yeah. just incredible. So where is zero? Zero is right here. Zero zero. Yeah, right here. Okay. In the in the belly button. In the belly button. Right in the gotcha. belly button. Yep. Yep. Which is cool. Like you can see, like, this is like the unit circle. Actually, it's, yeah. the, it's a circle with radius two. So unit gotcha. circle, okay. in, you know, in the middle row, that is two. And then, yep. so if you go here, if you put across here and here, so that's zero. So zero. it's in the yep. lower Dantian. Yeah. And that look, that is actually much more fun uh, when looking at Budabrat. Okay, Buddha brought the zero is right here at the at the literal the solar wow. plexus, the belly button. Isn't that cool? That is incredible. Do you see yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. That's the, they, they call yeah. that the lower Dantian in in Taoism, mm -hmm. and I believe that we could yeah. say that that point uh, up near the third eye there is the upper Dantian. Yep. That's yep. just fascinating. And actually, someone. Yeah, that's so cool that you know that stuff. Um, someone contacted me a while ago and they're doing their thesis on, on something, something to do with Buddhism. And they wanted to, to study the Buddha, uh, Buddha brought for, um, the chakra points mm. to try to identify the chakra points. So yeah. anyways, I mean, that's something I always wanted to do, but I never really kind of had time to do, but there, there's something there without a doubt. Now, if I recall correctly, the Buddha brats are generated from the outward dispersing points. Uh, so sort of yep. the outer world directed points. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. So all the points that are on the outer boundary and I kind of filter them. So I only use the ones close to the boundary. It makes a, a sort of a less fuzzy picture, makes a more clear picture. Mm. Um, yeah. Yes. 
And then, so I do, so this is kind of a probability distribution. You can think of it like a probability distribution. It's a histogram. Mm -hmm. So when I generate all those trajectories, this is all the trajectories, not all of them, but a whole bunch of them, right? So I, I take a whole bunch of points from this boundary and I iterate them and I plot them. And then I build up a histogram. So uh, the bright points are the points that get hit more with the trajectories. And mm -hmm. the dark points are the points that don't get hit with the trajectories. And it forms gotcha. this picture. And I really have no idea why. <laughs> I have no idea why it makes this picture. Huh. It just It's the most fascinating thing that I've ever seen in my entire life. I really have no idea why. Well, one thing I'll say is that it feels multidimensional. Uh, it feels like uh, something yeah. that has... Uh, a body to it, right? Yeah, it does. It feels, uh, it looks almost three-dimensional because there's yeah. dark and light. Your eyes yeah. trick you, you know, it looks almost yeah. three-dimensional, but I mean, it looks like a body. It looks like the costume, you know, of Buddha, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the, the Buddha's off, often painted with, you know, um, let's see if I have another, anyways, I, I'm not going to change right now, but it looks like, you know, a, a Tonka, a painting of Buddha with a beautiful costume and the beads and, you know, the, the thin bodice, you know, it always kind of thins out, you know, they have this sort of thin bodice and then they're sitting lotus position. Mm -hmm. Like you can't make this stuff up. Like, right. With the, you know, every time I have a, a giant one in my office here, that's about six feet tall. <laughs> Hmm. And I just stare at it and I go, I can't believe it makes this picture so, so um, beautiful. Are the different Buddha brats a different set of these uh, outward facing points or are, what other variables are there? Yeah, I just choose, there? yeah, I just choose slightly different points like in between, um, you know, so this is, you know, let's say I had a grid and the grid had a certain spacing, Right. So the spacing that I choose is going to be different values of C. Now, if I change the spacing, then I'm changing my, you know, my mm -hmm. initial conditions. And so that's what I do. I just change the spacing and, and get different values of, of, of C for the seed point for each point on the complex plane. And then I get different um, trajectories. So I get different pictures. So you could say that on a certain level, we're looking at a snapshot of different pathways through time. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Different pathways through time get and lead to different um, phenomenon. Lead to right. that's why we all have different lives. We all lead different lives instead of the same life, right? Because we are made up of different pixels of the universe. I guess you could say. Well, now the counterpoint to to Buddha brat is bubble brat, right? Which is using the yep. uh, oh. internal facing uh converging points right yep and yeah so that is bubble broth okay that's not the best one i have but i've got some nicer ones but that one's pretty pretty it sh kind of shows right the the bubble features so yeah when you take when you run the same the same uh, algorithm that i use to create uh Buddha brat, when i do the same thing with the inner points then you get bubble broth now, I think I heard you say in one of the videos that Bubble Brat doesn't have the variation that Buddha Brat has. Is that correct? Nope. When I change the spacing on, you know, when I do the same thing to try to make different Buddha Brats, it, it makes the same Bubble Brat. So you always get the same Bubble Brat? Always the same, like the same bulge here, the same bulge here, same bulge here. So I don't get different details like I do with food brought for some reason. Now that's just fascinating. I mean, if we, if we take that as part of the metaphor, right? Hmm. There is a kind of, so what you were saying a moment ago about the, the seed, which, uh, which is outward facing, which is sort of more expansive has a different path, but the, the inward yeah. facing one is kind of trapped by the black hole. It it can all it only has a yeah. certain geometry, if you like. That's what it looks like. Yeah. There's something quite profound about that. I find I find that really uh, evocative. Yeah. And that's the principle of incommensurability. The points on the inside do a completely different thing than the points on the outside. Yes. In every way 
that you look at it. There's no similarity. Let me just cut this out here. We might say that in some in some respects, we're talking about the difference between the path of light versus the path of darkness. Right. Yep. And so you can think of this as um, charge and discharge. So this would be, um, I wanted to call it charge, you know, give it a name that had something to do with charge. So, mm. you know, charge and discharge are incommensurate principles, mm. right? Charge is not discharge. And right. So this would be corresponding to charge or charging. Mm. And this would be correspond to discharge. So this is right. a discharge and this is charge. We can't see charge. Right. We can't see. <laughs> it, right. This is what it would look like if we could see it. Wow. Right. We can't see dark matter. And but we, you know, we can't see the black hole. We can only like the black hole. When we look at, we took a picture of black hole, what do we see? We saw a bright thing, right? Which like, was probably so there's part of the event horizon, you right? You can't see inner world. Sorry, say yeah. that again? Uh, the, the bright discharge that we saw was probably the event horizon or something, you know, it, it yeah. wasn't the black hole itself. Yeah, the event horizon, this is, yeah, the event horizon is sort of, you know, maximal discharge. It's, right. you know, it's all the brightest, like this is the brightest, this is visible matter, this is what we can see, right? That sort and, of thing. And you could potentially call the outer world as the field. And this could be yeah, a field, yeah. It looks like a field. You got these sort of gradient things, right? It, it really does kind of look like a field to me. So it could you could call it a field, yeah. And, you know, the Metagross set itself is a field in a way because in a field it's like every point, I define a field as, Every point in the field of view is assigned a value. So every point in the complex plane is, a, is assigned a value, a color mm. value. So we iterate it and we color it and give it some value, right? So, you know, this is by definition a field, a field diagram because I've assigned a color to every point in this circle. Mm. So that's, you know, by mm. definition, it's a field. It's yeah, can you t talk a little bit more about how the color is calculated? Yep, that's a good question. So what happens when you when you take a point in the complex plane, let's say we take a point right here, and you iterate it through the function, z equals z squared plus c. The, the, this is how the algorithm works. How many iterations does it take before it jumps out of this circle? Hmm. This is the radius 2. So... Uh, how many iterations does it take before it jumps out of the circle? That's it. So it's like the light sphere. All the points, all the, yeah. So all the points in this region only take, escape after one iteration. Huh. All the points in, in the next one, the next um, level, take two. One, two. Wow. Right? right. And the ones in here take one, two, three. So the ones at the edge here take hundred, a thousand, 10,000, a million. I found ones that took a million wow. before the escape. And those, those are the ones that look like what I was showing you that look like these guys, right? They look like nebula kind of really cool looking things, right? So um, these are the ones that take, you know, hundred thousand, maybe, you know, so the ones that take the most iterations have the most interesting patterns. Sometimes they look like um, galaxy clusters. This is just one point. This point here, one point, you could take this point and plug it in to your computer if you had my program, and it would make this picture right here. Huh. It would make this picture. Or uh, there's another one. I, I feel like uh, that's got to be a constellation out there. It looks like that. It looks like um, it, not constellation, galaxy clusters. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. It looks, let me show you this one. This, okay. So this, I believe, is the Virgo cluster. And here's a cluster I generated. They look very similar. Sure. Yep. And these little dots, that, right? That's in the equation. Right. So we're seeing the larger uh, uh, points of light are re similar or close, closely related data values, right? Closely related data values. The yeah. iterative function. Yeah, the iteration function is generating, you know, roughly similar values. Yeah, it lands here. This like it, the dots land here more often than they go out here. And they do elsewhere. Yeah. Right? So I'm plotting a bunch of dots. I'm just, it's like a pixel, you know, where you, uh, what do you call it? 
pointillism. Mm. So each iteration gives you a point and you plot it. Then you get the next point and you plot it. Then you get the next point and you plot it. And then eventually you end up with picture. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm starting to revise my vision of what the Mandelbrot set is actually showing. In a way, it's, it's just showing the, let me, see if I, let me see if I say this right. What we're seeing is the initial value of C and its, it's sort of brightness and color are the number of iterations before it leaves the circle on the outer edge, I guess. So yeah, then the, the exactly. on the inner on the yeah. inner edge it would be the number of iterations before it collapses to nothing, right? Correct. Well, it's, and I do that. I do that. But um, basically, it's traditional. It's tradition to paint these uh, the inner ones black if they don't escape. Gotcha. So there is a gradation. Yeah. That would be interesting to see. It just looks like it doesn't look pretty. It just looks like a bunch of little circles. Huh. Like I, you know, I've I've done it and I know what it looks like and it's not and it might be valuable. I don't know. I don't I just don't have a picture of that. I don't have a picture of it here. So the the other thing that's kind of interesting when we were talking about the bubble brought uh, and the idea that it represents, let's say, potential energy as opposed to the uh, kinetic energy of... Well, I'm thinking charge. Okay. I'm thinking charge. So potential energy, it's another one of those ambiguous terms that I'm trying to... Yeah, I like charge better. Charge and discharge. It's also the case that within the Buddhist tradition, uh, the practice of meditation is essentially building charge. So you're going to emptiness. It would be a charging process. Yep. Right? Yep. It's a charging process and it's <laughs> occurring within let's say the 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 emptiness, right? Which which yep. you know, although now that emptiness is maybe a little bit brought into question when it comes to inner space because you're saying that you could uh, envision it as being more of a gradient. But of course that's the case too when you're meditating, right? There are many different layers of settling. So focusing on the inner world has a, a, a depth that seems to know no end. Yep. Both, you know, there's never ending on both sides of the event horizon. So what they call emptiness, like you, we could say maybe we could call the black region emptiness, right? And we could, mm -hmm. you know, call the outer region, you know, fullness, right? And those two things could be the incommensurate principle. The emptiness and fullness are the two incommensurate principles. And the event horizon would be fulfillment, right? So mm. I've even been able to apply the principle of incommensurability to that kind of language, to the Buddhist language, or to any language, to every language. I've been able to apply, I've been able to find the incommensurability and then apply this model just as a um, teaching tool. So this would be emptiness, this would be fullness, and this would be fulfillment. Okay, fulfillment is is the event, is the life, is the, you know, the um, visible universe, the phenomenon, things that mm -hmm. happen to you, right? So, you know, and, you know, it's a poetic kind of way of looking at it. But, yeah, it's... So there's lots of ways of looking at this. Are you familiar with Mike McCullough's quantized inertia theory? Nope. He was a previous guest on the show. Uh, I think you'd find it very interesting. I'll just say a quick word about it. It basically uses the so-called quantum foam, quantum fluctuations as a mechanism for cosmological change. And you could think of it as replacing okay. dark energy. Oh, I see. Yeah. So you we you could think of it as being the field. It's it's a very elegant idea that accounts mm -hmm. for uh, galactic rotation without the need for dark matter. By the way. Um, okay. And yeah. And um, cool. I'll send you a link to it. I think I think you'd, rather than talk about yeah. it now, I think you'd find it interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, let's go back to the uh, to the video for a minute. These images are just. Stunning. Yeah. But, oh, and that I imagine right there is uh, fractal on the left and uh, a actual observed galaxy on the right. Right. Yep. Yep. And there's a lot of similarities. It's freak. They're frequent, freakishly similar, in my opinion. And then there's a, this beautiful painting 
that my friend Gaetan LaBelle did many years ago. I had an art show uh, and it was the art, you know, the art show was basically featuring Buddha brought, but I had him do this painting is about, you know, six feet tall. It's a very large painting. It's at the foot of my bed. It's quite large. But uh, anyways, it's just. Uh, I think I remember you speaking about this and saying that this was done before you uh, started playing around with Buddha brought. Is that right? Oh, this um, the idea came before I did. So I did another art show before I knew about Buddha brought where I did exactly like but it was a miniature show. So it was a tiny one. I did a Mendelbrot set with a um, with a Buddha. So I did three actually in a series. I did just the Mendelbrot set, then the Mendelbrot set with a Buddha, and then the Mendelbrot set with the with the Buddha brought. And that was a uh, three um, in a series at a in a miniature show. So I had the idea before. Oh no no sorry. It was the Mendelbrot set and the Buddha, and then the Buddha inside of the Mendelbrot set. I didn't know about Buddha brought yet. So then Buddha Brock came to me. Then Buddha Brock came to me. I'm like, oh, I have to do an art show on Buddha Brock. And then this painting was just sort of, um, you know, part of the uh, part of the show. This brings up one more feature that, that we hadn't yet discussed, which is that uh, at certain intersections, I think uh, you said where there's four uh, intersections of what's the best way of putting it? The, the fractal lines, you get another like mini brat, you get mini brats throughout where yep. you have the intersection of four lines. Is that correct? Um, oh, okay. So I think I know what you're talking about. Um, let me just see here. Uh, let's just see if I can find an example. Which is sort of hinted yeah. at here where you have the, the, the Buddha sitting within yeah. the heart chakra of the Buddha. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So when you're zooming in to the Mendelbrot set. Um, you don't always find a Buddha brought, but you know where to find them. And I'm just trying to see if I have a good example here. Whenever you see chiral symmetry, okay, wherever you see chiral symmetry, mm -hmm. then, you know, source, and that I call that a bifurcation point. So whenever you see a bifurcation point, mm -hmm. that's where you're going to find um, another, another, um, Mendel brought another brought another brought. brought yeah right so um which has which has all of the features of the, i mean the only yeah. limitation here is the is that of the processor the, yeah it has all of the features yeah. of the well it's very similar the, let's say they might meta brought. Yep, and but sometimes like they, like the details are going to be different right so what is the costume mm -hmm. is going to be different so here's a you know every each of these hmm. Um, let's just have a look at another one here. Oh, let me zoom. You know, each one has a different, there we go, you know, a different pattern around it. Now, here's an example of the bifurcation right. point I was telling you about. I know for sure that if I zoom in on this point here, I'm going to find a Mendelbrot. And of course, you know, there's one in here. Mm. So I, you know, I it's starting to get to know, I didn't know that for a long time. I actually thought. So here's this galaxy one. I thought that I would find a Mendelbrot in here if I zoomed in enough. I zoomed in forever and I couldn't mm. find one because there's no bifurcation point there. So this is going to spiral in forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. It's kind of like if I was going to find- Is that on the inside? That's on the inside of a, it's an inside point? There, it never goes inside. Inner world? It never goes to inner world. It just gets closer and closer and closer to inner world, but never gets to inner world. So it's somewhere right on the boundary. Kind of. So there's, you know, so this tells me that there's something in our universe like that. And there is something in our universe like that. And it's called an infinitely collapsing magneton, I think. I think. It's a, it's a, um, huh. yeah. So... It sounds like on some level, we could get a sense of where inner and outer world are yeah. in the universe based on the morphology of the objects. Yes. That's fascinating. So this galaxy probably is, doesn't have, a, a, you know, a black hole. Not a real black hole. It's going to have something that looks a lot like a black hole, but you're never going to find the event horizon. Or maybe the 
appearance of a mini brat in the middle of something signifies more than just a black hole. Maybe it signifies like, let's say the potential for a world, the potential for, for life, instead of it just being an object, right. something, something like that. It, you can think of it like in terms of electronic, you think of it as a terminal. It's a terminal. Well, that fits perfectly into the EU paradigm. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So when, sorry, I just want to find a good one Are here. Are those uh, microscopic images that, I, that you have there? I see, I see some things that look like they, they were under a microscope. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was just something I found. I wanted to relate this to biology, like I told you, as a cosmologist. So this is a cell. Okay, and inside the cell, well, you have a nucleus, but you also have something called a nucleolus. Okay, and I just thought it was interesting that the nucleolus was almost always attached to, and this would be the nucleus, and then the cell would be sort of outside of that. And then I found another picture of a nucleolus that looks a lot like a, the Mendelbrot set where you have like the head and the huh. little, you know, feet things, whatever. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. And then when you look at cell... Um, the phases of a cell look a lot like the phases, things that we see in, um, out in, you know, cosmology and that's the fractal paradigm. So I want to try to relate cell biology to cosmology. Yep. And that's real cosmology. Right. So I can find, you know, all of the, the prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, interphase, whatever in, I can find similar objects in um, mm. cosmology. So, right. yeah. So I actually, I found this somewhere else. Someone know this was image came from somewhere else. I don't actually have the link to it, but um, you know, I found it. I didn't actually generate this. Someone else found this. They had the similar idea, I guess, but right. oh, no, 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 that, never mind. Yeah. 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 Someone else kind of found, discovered this. So, you know, this is a fractal paradigm, you know, as above, so below um, happening possibly in real life. And that, Understanding that should give us some insights into what's happening at each scale. Absolutely. So knowing what's happening here should give us insights to how do these formations form. Whatever this is doing, this is probably doing. And there's just such poetic truth to it that that you know it's it's a it's a fulfilling <laughs> place to to stand to be able to see this to to mm -hmm. stand yeah. on this uh, boundary condition and have a sense of. Yeah. Uh, of the the totality that we're some little part of is just wondrous. Exactly. And so I, I want to mm -hmm. really thank you for uh, all the work that you've done. And uh, I look forward to um, understanding some of the things that you work on that I can't understand. <laughs> There's a few things and maybe mm -hmm. uh, that would be the subject for our next conversation to talk about some of the things that I don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah, because I'm hoping that this approach will actually help people understand that, that want to understand but don't understand. If I can somehow bridge the gap with the language, if I can like simplify the language and, and just use term, like, unambiguous terms, and then I re-explain everything using those unambiguous terms, then hopefully it, you know more people can uh, understand and get involved. Well, thank you so much, Lori. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. It was my pleasure. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening. We look forward to serving you again soon. In the meantime, remember, turn that thing over a few times before you pick it up and take it home. <laughs>